are back. You're in the club. We're going clubbing today. Club Colors in the club. Powered by Club Colors. Thanks for joining us today. We're totally excited. We've got Sean Scope on the show today. By the way, Club Colors is a full-service brand management firm. Anything you can think of that you want to put a logo on, we can source it. We can decorate it. We can kit it. We can ship it. Concept to doorstep. Direct to home. We got you covered. And hey, look, it's all about creating solutions. That's our focus. Today, the solution is talking to Sean Scope. Sean is a senior sales executive at TSP Family Office. They are tax attorneys, accountants, experts, strategists, estate planning, uh, putting together the best strategy for small businesses and large businesses and hospitals and doctors and you name it to essentially pay their fair share in taxes, but no more than that, and to make sure that they protect themselves. Sean is, by the way, an expert in sales, team building, consulting, uh, and um, you know, and also management. I mean, for for that for that uh, portion of your year, you did a ton of man a portion of your career, you did a ton of management, and now you're back in that spot again. Sean, thanks right. for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, John. It's great to hear your voice. I'm excited. I'm pumped up. I'm always pumped up from Johnny Mo. Boy. Let's go, baby. Hey, we got the yeah. same haircut. We got the same look. You got to stop stealing my look and doing it better. That's I not did. nice. You, That's you, you, uh, I happen to have a choice in the matter. You didn't have a choice. So your hair fell out. And <laughs> yes, I shaved exactly. my head. My head. Um, you could grow it back. And here we are. You know? Yeah. Better looking today. Better looking today. Yes. And, and, yep. uh, Thriving in business. Tell everybody a little bit about what you specialize in. Just give us a little background on who you are and kind of what you specialize in and what you're doing for clients these days. Okay, so um, for the last six some odd years, uh, I've been finding clients for uh, a tax advisory firm, a small boutique firm. Uh, my ideal person that I'm uh, targeted uh, towards working with is someone that's making a million dollars or more. Um, typically owns a business. Uh, I've been able to develop a, a practice area, if you will, with surgeons and doctors, which has been a really good fit uh, for me and that vertical. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in the job, uh, Mo, and, and you get this because you've been a sales manager. So you, the world is your oyster. Go find somebody. And it takes a certain person to do that. So I've been doing that for six years. You know, I, I love and enjoy meeting quality people, no matter what the outcome is. I love conversation. I love just how different people are. I embrace all of that stuff. So it's a perfect spot for me because I get to be happy and who I am. And I get to make a couple of bucks and I'm changing people's lives. Uh, and I work from my home. You're in my uh, my little shoe box. Yeah, I, see the, I see the jackets yeah. hanging in the back. Case you know a client I only comes calling. I for special people, though, John. I <laughs> love it. I love it. I get it. I get it. So those of you that don't know, Sean and I go way back. In fact, Sean and I uh, acted as partners at two different firms uh, in previous careers, and yeah. uh, we were yin yin and yang, uh, ham and eggs, peanut butter and jelly, whatever you want to call it. Sean was out in the field. I was in the headquarters at the office, one of the stiffs, if you will. And uh, we ran a team of straight commission salespeople that were putting together business solutions for clients, management, consulting, taxes, mergers, acquisitions, and so on. So get into a little bit about what it is that you're doing currently. And then I want to touch on kind of how we went through the process of team building and, and some okay. of your expertise in doing so. All right. So, so currently, uh, you know, I have that practice area. That's my focus. Uh, I'm actually to the point now where my my contribution is just more than bringing somebody to the table so that we can service them. It's really um, being able to line that up in a way and doing work on the front end so that we free up capacity and you know we can spend more time with the client because no matter where you work in consulting, no matter what consulting, time is value, period. How many times have you heard, if the client's talking to you, let them talk. I mean, you I know? can't tell you how many times I've said to my sales team, previous sales team, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, if a client is on the call, if I ever hear you end a call, <laughs> right? Unless the client <laughs> on the other end is like, hey, man, yeah. I got to I gotta go, right? right? Then I get that. But to end a call with a client uh, on your own, 
I think is one of the worst things you could possibly do. Let the client talk as long as they would like to talk with you. Have them talk with you. You're under yeah. the same thought process, right? Well, I actually learned that from you because you were a phone guy way before I was a phone guy. So um, that it's 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 true. You you just have to use your wits and understand people. But a lot of those similarities, John, we don't we don't ever have to get away from that because that's just the nature of uh, how people communicate and 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 make deals together. So, um, and, and that's the best part of this job. That's the way we work at the firm. It's very hands-on, uh, lots of attention. Uh, we don't start a clock when somebody makes a phone call. So it's a little, it's a little different than the large tax consulting firms in that you're getting, um, I hate the term nickel and dime, but you're being, you're paying unnecessary fees because of lazy pricing. The meter's front. running, right? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Give them a price up front. What's your best shot, dude? Let's go. Let get these people in service. Figure it out. But to do that and then add on and do all that stuff to me, it's just I I don't like having to present it that way. Sometimes you have to because yeah. you're not doing some of the work. But for the most part, being able to work individually with people to uh, create a scenario over maybe three to five years initially to say, this is where you're going to be in five years. This is how much money you're gonna have in your pocket from the savings and compounding the savings with investments that, uh, you know, where to put it, how to shield against taxes, how to cut taxes, mitigate taxes, tax-free uh, retirement, and let that grow. So it's really about the long game for us, which is very different than what we did. We were in a fix-it shop. Yeah. We were in a fix it shop. Occasionally, uh, a job would run longer than expected. But typically, if we could not get a turnaround in a business to get it set up with uh, uh, SOPs and things like that, so they have a good running start, that's an eight week job. There's no reason yeah. for that. And there wasn't a lot of partnership, right? It, and no. it, it wasn't one no, of those things where it was like, you're going to follow up. It was somebody had a massive issue. They needed it corrected fast. And you yeah. were going in there like a bulldozer to get it correct and get it fixed, try and create as much value and benefit. And then it was kind of like, hey, what's the next thing? Whereas what you're doing now is more of a relationship where you're in it for the long game. So it's yeah. steps along the way to utilize uh, tax structure, IRS tax code, tax strategy to build out the long game for the clients, which is ultimately building value in their business and building their personal assets, yeah? Absolutely. And, you know, on the back of that is how do you create all of that for them and then make it transportable to the next generation and the next generation without any type of significant tax consequences with a certain expectation of what what they're going to get and the cool thing about tax planning is its perspective right so you could set something today and really look out and say hey you know if i funded uh, a Roth IRA for my two-year-old for the next 25 years at eight and a half percent. By the time that kid's 59, they're going to have a boatload of money because yeah. it just sat there and got fat and pregnant and it's in a tax-free environment. So what we're really trying to do, John, is to create the liquid from the savings and then that, turn that into wealth and then preserve and protect the wealth for the long run. So yeah, our, our view is we have to do what we have to do now and those become good habits, but along the way, they're getting more value, like you said, right? You're setting them up for future generations. It's it's an interesting concept, and that family office uh, suffix in our name really defines what that is. You've got all these different experts. You know this question. When was the last time you were in a room with your attorney, your CPA, <laughs> your relative? Yeah. Right. How, so, and so, how's that billable hour? Right. So this, this is the same, this is holistic. the same, it's a holistic approach. Yeah. It's the same business argument too, right? Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, there's a point and a counterpoint to this and people have different views of this. So what it does is it allows the information since it's financial and since it's sensitive and since it's got to be exact, um, it, it, it really promotes the uh, looking at it in a way uh that involves everybody from their angle. So you're getting impact and influence. So I'm going to do this today on a current income tax savings. How does that affect X here? And then if we're going to do that, and there's all this stuff going it's the on. the anatomy, that, right? The anatomy of a business.
and you're sitting there orchestrating yeah. all of the parts together. And it, it creates a, a relationship between us and the client that allows us to be creative together. You get this because of what uh, the fabulous work that Club Colors does with, you know, creativity and taking somebody else's creativity yeah. and then to the next level and to the next level. This really allows us to create in a way that's creative and uh, individualized to what they really want. Um, does it take time? Yes. Is it cheap? No. Uh, because it's worth something. <laughs> yeah, well, there's you know, a big return it, on it. But to yeah, the point of, of the, uh, it's the anatomy of the business, right? And the reason mm -hmm. I use that analogy is if you think about it, you know, if if a doctor says, hey, we've got to take the kidney out, they have to take measures to look at all the other organs and how that affects the body. And they need to be right. able to understand that everything that happens within the body affects another part of the body. And that's the yeah. same th thing within a business and within mm -hmm. tax strategy and planning. Mm -hmm. So, so what I love about what you guys are doing is taking that holistic approach because you're not just coming in and targeting one area where now somebody has got to call another expert in to essentially adjust, correct, fix the thing that was affected. Cause you had a positive result on that, that one element that you do because you're holistic, you're thinking about step ahead and step ahead and step ahead of when this is corrected, this will now be impacted. So now we need to prepare for that. And it's that whole that whole thought process into yeah. creating a liquid environment for your clients. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And it when it happens, uh, beautiful thing. It's what well, it is to hear the clients talk about, um, you know, express their gratitude and and tell you the stories about what it's done for them, their family. Yeah, you know, it, it has a really profound impact on a lot of people, not just that individual. It's so much it's like this spider web of people that it affects. And generational so impact. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And and that, you know, for me, and you know me pretty well, that really instills a, a really good warm feeling in me. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's that's good stuff right there. That's a good reason to be doing this. So let's talk and, about that warm feeling, Sean, because that I want people to understand the type of person you are. I so, had chili from <laughs> So Brian Burns, who if you're on LinkedIn uh, or in the sales game, you know who Brian Burns is. I mean, yeah. the brutal truth about sales, right, or selling. Yeah. And he's yeah. got a podcast. And by the way, he does amazing walk and talks, right? So he's walking. I think he's somewhere in Canada because I can tell by the accent. But he's walking through this beautiful neighborhood. At least he must have been from Canada. And he's got Sweaty. the thing of he's talking about how you know, sales managers and CRMs and da, da 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 And it's so entertaining and it's so true. Unless you're a sales manager, which I was at one point, I'm like, come on, Brian, you're killing my game here, baby. <laughs> but so Brian puts a post out on LinkedIn and uh, the post was really cool because it was an opportunity for people to showcase um, rather than saying, hey, you should have me on your podcast, right? They, he, he opened up a platform and opportunity for people to promote a peer, a friend, somebody that that oh, mentored yeah. them or whatever it was. So here's the coolest thing about this, right? So the post was, uh, we're looking for a next next uh, podcast guest. It's got to be the best salesperson that you've ever met in your life. Please drop in the comments. Who's the best salesperson you've ever met in your life? Well, Sean, being the dude that he is, put like 12 names down, right? And he put like all this support for all these other people. I was privileged to be one of those people. Uh, which I felt silly about, but uh, he puts all these other people. And here's what I love about Brian. Brian looked at that and went, you know what? You're the best salesperson because you're acting as an agent for all these other people. So guess who ended up getting that slot? Sean ended up being on that podcast. Now, the reason I bring that up is one of the things that Sean talked about was um, creating your own pipeline and building um, your own pipeline, but not having to do it in a manner where you're like knocking on doors, um, and doing this unbelievable amount of game of numbers, cold calling and blanketing a, an area, but to work really smart in doing it so that the quality of the conversations that you're having is far more impactful and you're, you're upsetting less people, if you will, in order to get to that. But moreover, something extremely important in Sean's life is quality of life. He's got a beautiful daughter, beautiful wife. It's extremely important to him. So talk to us a little bit about how did you build this pipeline? of, uh, you know, what, seven figures or whatever of business that you brought in last year for your organization and did it by without a really a CRM process, self-generated opportunities. How did you do that? Well, I, I think it goes back to what you you brought out before, uh, Mo, when you were talking about it being a relationship sale and 
being able to have a, a true relationship and a long lasting relationship with people that you're providing a service for. Um, it doesn't need to be subservient. It could be a mutual, you know, it's okay to like your clients. All right. You don't need to have such a stiff barrier. You could have mesh, but you don't need a brick wall between you and your client. And that's tough with there. advisor type sales, like professional advisor, intangible it's service services type of selling right, because there's a right. certain level of barrier that you do have to have where you've got to be able to kind of ping them and go no that's not the way that it is or you have to be you know pretty stern with them up front so you can break them down to get them to admit to the challenge so that you can then become a solution you took a completely different methodology than was traditionally taught in mergers right. and acquisitions and consulting. You took a completely mm -hmm. different method, which is refreshing. How did you, so how, what is the style and then how did you build this self-generated pipeline so effectively? So it was really like looking at, you either have to step off the cliff or you don't. You either go for it, like, okay, I don't want company sponsored leads anymore. I'm gonna cut myself off and start, start on some of this. now. I was blending at first, right? I would take company leads and I would start self. It, it's a progression. Sure. I think I, I cut pretty early and put a lot of pressure on myself. And I said, it's, you got, you got to do it. You got to go through it. So uh, I started reaching out to uh, current clients. I didn't have that many. Um, and it was really important. And this is a Brian Burns thing, right? I didn't call him up and say, Hey, you got any referrals for me? <laughs> You know, what 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 I thought about is how can I create something that's beneficial for all of the stakeholders in this phone call? So I've got me, I've got my company, I've got the client. And what I discovered is it's OK to call the client and just say, hey, how you doing? You need anything from us? Because if he does, I know about it. I can take care of it. If there's an issue, I can get right on it. So we want to, you know, I know we'll get accolades because we do really good work, but let's not wait to get in there and really service the accounts and and find out what our clients want and because we i started doing that and 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 drilling down a little bit better obviously uh, and and you know how i um typically bring on consulting clients you know my style you know how they're prepared i set expectations i, I i've been coached through selling consulting services for 25 you know I, it's, it's managing expectations is everything right, right. That's that's what it is. Um, so I get to use a lot of those transferable skills, but those couple of clients in the way that I approached them was I want to do this um, in a way that benefits everybody. It's not just me getting a referral and making a sale. It's not me putting up a number for somebody on my side. It's not me, you know, uh, reacting to something the client brought up uh, first. So this created a proactive approach to getting into your clients and really having relationships with them. And since that time, our company's done really well in creating uh, that feel for clients. It's very important what that feel is to the point where when we send out our monthly to all of our clients, there'll be just a human interest story about one of our clients because it's just a cool thing. Yeah. Like last month that I have a client, he and his wife are uh, adopting a child that they've been fostering for a long time. And it's a, it's a really great story. And he just sold his business and we're working on taxes and we're setting up things for the kid. It's a great story and it was great timing. Um, it's the, uh, it reminds me of a, a particular contractor from New Jersey that you probably remember that had a great story yeah, as well. Yeah. So, uh, um, side joke, um, but <laughs> it, it's, it's that 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 really made it happen. So, you know, I just kind of set uh, a very high standard for a kind of a white glove approach to speaking with these folks. If and I was touching them, I would it was like a poke system. So it would either be an email, a text, a phone call, not all three, yeah. one or the other. And sometimes just a casual text is just want to see how you and your family are doing. Do you need anything from us here? talk soon, Sean. I mean, something like that. People like that. And you know what? We should be doing that. Yes. It and doesn't take off. There's some to that because that. that's kind of branding uh, mm -hmm. versus marketing, right? So marketing being that our outward push with a call to action, right? right? These are the services we have. Fill out this data. We'll set up uh, an appointment. We'll go through a yes. consultation or a demo and that, 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 and you're kind of getting passed off. 
there's a certain right. beauty to the branding side, which is talking more about the feeling and the, mm -hmm. the connection and telling stories about successful clients and mm -hmm. not just we had this client and the client had this problem and we were able to save them X amount of dollars, right? That's a nice case study. But what you're talking about is getting uh, into what's more enriching in the, the story, the brand story, which is uh, letting people come to the conclusion that because you're interacting with this client and those services that you have, that you may have freed them up, opened up the opportunity for them to do this bigger thing in their life. And that creates far more feeling. And, and I got to tell you, we are so uh, technology focused now that we're craving mm -hmm. feeling. Yes. And but yeah, that, you think we're being starved out a little bit? Oh, do you think? I mean, <laughs> you can't hug each other. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. So I love the fact that your touches were more like, hey, how are you? Is there anything that we can do uh, or what's going on in your life? Uh, kind of a situation I, and then let them come to you. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, John, I'm completely transparent with my clients about my life. I mean, they're in my office like you are. So, yeah. you know, they, they know about my family now and I want them to know that. And I want to know that about them. I think it just makes for a better relationship. And yeah, if you're looking at it mechanically, yeah, it builds trust and all that thing that happens naturally. If you just do the right thing, if you have your own set of rules, if, you had, you know, if you followed my rules, and you did the right thing. It would just happen. Yeah. It would. Um, so I don't think there there needs to be this um, sterile approach to um, uh, even the most transactional of transactions, right? Yeah. Hey, can you change your five? You know, it's, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I think people should just um, uh, think about why are they doing? What's the purpose? Why am I having this conversation? And from what I really keep in the back of my mind is one word is experience. I want that person to have a favorable experience, whatever, however, even they if they say no, favorable is. even exactly, exactly. It, it, they'll determine what favorable is, but I want them to have an experience that no matter what happens, um, I want them to feel good about having an experience with me and the firm. If it's for five minutes or 50 years, you know, so, and I, that really keeps you kind of in down in your, in your stance, if you know what I mean, yeah. it keeps you regulated not to tend to bounce around and, and lose yourself with clients at times. So, uh, I don't know what else to tell you. What's I the mean, most fun that you've had, uh, in your career? What's the most fun that ever? you've had ever, or, you know, what's the most fun that you've had in, in the sales part? Cause you know, so, some, there's a certain extent, some, like as you mature in your sales uh, career and then you get a little bit more, you know, uh, responsibility and you're having to manage people and projects and all these different I, types of things. Yeah. So you go through these different journeys, but what, but we can all kind of go back to a time where we go, I was most fulfilled then because I had the most fun. When was the most fun for you? What's the best story that you have? You know, some of the best fun I've had on jobs has been grueling and really challenging. Yeah. And some of it has been, you know, I should have been probably wearing a diaper, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> um, excuse me. Uh, but I, I think when I, the most fun I've ever had was, was probably, uh, one of the places where we worked together, uh, because I was surrounded by, uh, oodles of sales talent just a lot so of talent. Much sales talent i've never seen that before in my life yeah. and it was you know it was a, a really uh pivotal in my career in the way that i sold and i had a consulting background prior to that that really um you know that was a whole new experience for me so and i i met some wonderful people um, and I've had some amazing times. I still have relationship. You and I are still mm -hmm. friends after all of these years. And even you and I are friends with same, some of the same people from those times. So, uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, the most fulfilling is, uh, probably turning a project around and letting, you know, people keep their jobs and affect the town. There yep. was a, a job that I don't know if you know this story and how much time do we have as much as you want, baby. 
As long right, as people so, are listening. Is everyone still listening? Yeah, they're still listening, Sean. So I was headed to a job as a boots on the ground consultant somewhere in Alabama. I can't even remember where it was. And the team had been there and they briefed in with everybody around the big table in the morning with the coffee and they're getting ready uh, to open a project, right? So I got there late. I was coming from another assignment. Um, someone will catch me up. So we break um, and I was going to go get a soda. So across the street, there was a fill-in station. So I- <laughs> One of the fill-in stations, on. yeah. I moseyed on over. <laughs> The, and, uh, Baltimore, the Baltimore guy finds Alabama, finds an right. Alabama filling station. So I'm walking across the street and I'm, you know, suited up, yep. and every cuff, the whole thing, right? And so I'm walking across the street and it's one of these old style gas stations that has like a, it's like a Getty station or something. It had an old, the pumps were not even like they look today. And you had to walk up a couple of steps to get into a little store that had whatever. As I'm walking over, I stepped in a puddle and drenched it up to my ankle. Oh, my God. And, and by this time, I was running from the airport. My stuff is in the car. It's just, yeah. it's been a horrible day. So I walk into the store and I ask for soda. And guy behind the counter was like, over there. So I went and I got, and told me it was a $1.50 or whatever it was. And then he looks at me and he goes, are you one of them fellers that's going to save that, their jobs? And I was like, uh, we're certainly going to try. We're certainly going to try, sir. You know, I'm trying to be polite. He looks at me and goes, try not to step in any puddles. Oh, Lord. Wow. So, so that was, that was something that will stick with me forever. And at that time, I had not briefed in, but I realized that everybody that worked in there lived in this small town. That's all they had. And that filling and station they, was counting on you fixing that business. They made wire baskets for Hallmark that they would fill at Easter or whatever. Yeah. It's a little wire place that they did this. Lost all the business. They pulled the contract. That's all they had. They've been doing it for 30 years. Well, there's a lesson. Don't have 85% of your revenue with one client. Wow. Yeah. So it's, that was the story. Uh, anyway, we, we went through this. I, I met some wonderful people. Um, it, this was a challenge to get how, what were we going to do? We ended up negotiating with club cadet and they ended up making the baskets for the back of the car. Oh, thank God. I thought you were going to go like a total rebrand, but man, you went in and negotiated a new contract with a big player. That's really cool. So what was so what's some of the feedback that you've gotten from some of those folks? That's a, you've saved li saved some lives there. Yeah, I I was you know and I was fortunate enough to be with a really talented team as well. Um, I was a I was a junior guy on that, um, but I really did say, why don't they just make different kinds of basket? That's not the only yeah. basket in the world. Schwinn, everybody has baskets. You know, you could figure it out. So. They were able to do it. They didn't. They didn't downsize, and they ended up uh, growing over the next three to five years. Um, but it's still, it's still going. You know, I could tell that that uh, you had a you had a pause there. I could tell that that still hits you emotionally, and that's it does. that's it the great, great part about you, Sean. Is is you've got this. Um, you're you're the first guy in to defend a friend in a fight. Um, yeah. You're the first dude who's going to. Um, you know, raise the point that nobody else wants to hear, right? <laughs> that might upset yeah. the apple cart. And you're going to do that. But yeah. man, you carry, but it's with purpose. You carry it with you. And um, you're, you're an emotional dude, which is pretty interesting. Most consultants have to kind of lose that emotion a bit. Um, I, I think it depends on which emotion and at what time. Yeah. Right? So so I think it's perfectly fine if there's if there's a touching moment or a moment that sh makes you human. Yeah. There's nothing stronger than that. I think as a salesperson, you should be good enough and have enough confidence to be a little vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The way that I look at it is, look, if I've 
I, if I have something to offer, you have a problem, a situation, whatever. If there's a fit, great. If not, it doesn't mean that I, that people can't get something out of that. Yeah. I just don't want to waste even opportunities that don't shake out to be clients or those long relationships. It's still a relationship. It's just a little one. And it takes a lot of little ones to make the long one. So, um, it, it, it is touching when you're able to get with clients and see them achieve things. And especially when it spills over into uh, really how it dictates how they're going to live their life. Because in, at the end of the day, it's your job. I know you you're know? on, I know you're on the sales side of the equation, right? But you sure. also are interacting with uh, the folks that are JDs and tax attorneys. And, and yeah. obviously in order to sell professional services like that, you have to have enough of a knowledge base to be able to I make it all up, <laughs> you have to have enough of a knowledge base to kind of wet the whistle of a client to get the credibility to get to the point of now we bring in the expert, right? You have to so, know what questions to ask and all that stuff. So you're saying that you should know something about the things that you're selling. You should know something about the product. Just this product bit. happens to be this product <laughs> has to be pretty intricate, right? It's it's and in in many cases it's intangible. So I, yeah. I I'm curious. Um, how are you seeing uh, the sales game uh, change? Or what would you say is, is um, you know, interesting or different about how folks uh, that sell intangibles are having to approach the marketplace in a more virtual world? Okay. So before I address that, we have to agree on one thing. Sure. We should agree that the problems that my type of clients have still exist. Yes. Okay, so what I'm dealing with is the same problem in different environments with different competitors. It's the it's all of the stuff that I have to navigate. The bottom line is if my client didn't have a problem anymore, then it doesn't matter and none of that other stuff matters, yeah. right? Yeah. So don't do don't go down that road. So the client that that's that's good. That means that we can actually help people. They want help, we can provide help. That's wonderful. Now Competition, uh, same challenges that any business has, competition, financing, cash flow for the client to, to, to be able to get into it. Uh, how quick is the return in consulting, right? The turn is very important. I'm going to give you guys $40,000, $80,000. When am I going to get that Yeah, back? when am I getting it's the return really on important. that? It's really important. The return, the, the, the flip has to be quick on the return. Um, consulting firms that don't have that um, or are significant in, in the short term, a year or less, um, that's not how it's supposed to go. You've got to make the client as much money as you can, as fast as you can. You don't, you don't take your time doing it because every second counts and it just adds to the value and the benefit. That's why they hired you. And Nobody building wants... the partnership, I would imagine. Right, right, right. So, um, I think the environment's Mo, it's, it's, you know, the internet, it's, the, the legislation, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but the way that information is disseminated, um, the access to information, it's, it's the same challenges that, uh, that any other business has. But we, I'm going to use the oldest rule in the world. Just do the right thing. All of that stuff is noise. If you continue to do the right thing, there's nothing more powerful than somebody telling somebody else that they know, like, and trust, and even love about what you do or whatever. That's, that's who I want to do business with. I don't want to put my stuff out on, I'm very, very one-on-one -on -one focused with my clients, which is um, where I like to be. You guys do universities. I mean, how many clients, <laughs> realistically, uh, there's 31,000 clients that, you know, this, it's huge. It's a it's lot. A lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of people to satisfy. And the volume of work that you guys have to do is exhausting. When I see your videos of what people are doing, I'm like, are you kidding me? I'd be exhausted. But um, the fact that you can impact that many people the way that you do is 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 just as important or even more important than one at a time. You're able to impact a lot of people at one time. I am, but it kind of has to go like that. Yeah, it's you're start right with out of the, the gate. Yeah. You're you're right out of the gate. You're impacting a lot of it. It's yep. a big block. Yep. You know, mine's more like a wedge by the time I get to that point. 
But it was my choice to go into a business that's exclusive, that's extremely competitive. Um, you know, we're not the only people that do this in some shape or form. So the only thing that I have to go on is our reputation, which is stellar. Um, and the fact that we're able to um, treat our clients a certain way, you know, um, we're constantly asking them what they think, what works, what doesn't work. Um, again, we're showing, showing that vulnerability, like we know we're not perfect, but we want to be better for our clients who would know better than our clients. Would you share with us? Yeah. So, you know, we're doing, we're getting the Google reviews. We're doing this. We don't actively go out and like solicit them, um, because we don't want to put together a campaign to call all your clients. That's not who we are as a culture. Yeah. Right? We love getting it, them. There's a we certain rather, level of confidentiality to the, the marketing is, play is. and the lead generation and the brand, the branding. Um, you know, you're not going to see. I mean, we're just we're just in completely different spaces. But even in the space that you're in, right, you're not seeing a lot of your competition running a whole bunch of um, promotional right. or yeah. or ads or marketing plays. Right. Um, it's a lot of white paper type stuff and a lot of case study type stuff. And a lot of that having to do with you got to be very uh, general and not set an expectation that you could do one thing for one client and now you could do it for a thousand because every single client that you interact with has a completely different set of circumstances, which right. changes the strategy. Somebody mm -hmm. says they want a thousand t-shirts with two colors on it and they want, you know, they want it in two weeks. I could get 12 peak companies to say the same exact thing. The logo is different, but it's two colors and it's right. going a thousand, you know, it's a thousand places so that we can really um, tell a lot of stories, right. market to the masses, create a lot of content about that rhythm. Yours, mm -hmm. on the other hand, like you said, is a lot of organic one-on-one -on -one customized strategy building to the particular client's situation. We used to always say, you know, this like every business is like a snowflake. There's no two alike because unless you've got complete clones of every employee and product and everything else, every single business is different, which means the tax code is going to work differently for them. Yeah, it, it does. Um, we we actually with our newer guys in business development will run um, maybe like a radio ad. Yeah. For a limited time, just because you don't come into a job with a stack of clients. When I started in the job, I uh, was into a, a bunch of leads that had been there. Somebody working, nothing, whatever. It was a, just a mixed bag of nuts. And I started with that and I cultivated my clients out of that. And it took, you know, I said, OK, this is what it's going to take. But I see I saw where this would be in three years at that point. I said, if I do this, this, and that, I can get there. I would be willing to do that for, you know, being able to work out of my home, being around my uh, my daughter. So the work-life balance that you mentioned before, you're right. It's really important. Um, the uh, clients that would come in from outward bound on our behalf are are somewhat different than clients that would come from a direct referral from a client. Yeah. So one of the things, one of the things that, um, you know, we were able to do was distinguish without being diff, without really being different, how to take someone that wasn't introduced to you, just heard an ad and called in. It's basically a, just what is this about kind of thing. And then it's up to you to, you know, find out what's going on, see if you can help them, right? But we want to have the, the guys or the gals only do that for a limited amount of time and create more relationships and let this thing kind of snowball because the ideal place for us to be as an organization is to have, you know, uh, six, 10 people that have these circles of influence and are out there, uh, you know, mingling with the right person, the person that aligns to, or what they think is important is important to us. We have aligned values. Those types of situations is what makes business work. You and I were able, we, we kicked some ass. Okay. When we used to, we work did, together. I'll be honest, we did. And it's because, and we we're we're very similar, but we're so different in yeah. a lot of ways. 
Um, but we were so committed to doing that because I think we, from the beginning, were like, oh, we're going to do this. We were excited about it. You know, yeah. we're naive. No, I thought we really said, I think we're going to be able to do this. And we had we a pretty good it. strategy, you know, though. You know what? You know what we did. I don't. I don't remember what the numbers were or whatever. But we, you know, we turned around. Well, we we took a region from forty five percent for the year. The year before, we took it over and we hit one hundred and thirty percent in one year. And how many? How, we turned how over every every team? person in the in the in the region, but I think about six. Um, how big was our? How many people did we have on our roster? Forty five. Yeah. So that's 45 decentralized people with all different skill levels. Multiple states, straight commission. So, yeah, John is, you know, in in the house and, and headquarters, and I'm out there riding around with one of these people for a couple of days, <laughs> popping around. And Sean and would like, say to him, he goes, all right, listen, I'm going to train you today. All right, here's the deal. Like, if you speak, I'm dropping you <laughs> off at the bus stop. <laughs> like, don't say a word. He's like, if you literally say a word if the client if i ask the client a question and the client has not answered yet and you chime in and speak i'm dropping you off at the bus stop moreover if the client is speaking and you interrupt or you throw a question in, i'm dropping you off at the bus stop because it really yeah. was a structure that we have put so, in place as to how you how you position a client to get them to buy instead of being sold right right and so that's that is kind of how this happens right so what's next? What do we need to do? Uh, how do we start? Uh, what do you need from me? I mean, and that's that's where you 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 want to end up with a client. You want them to be excited about yeah. the decision. You never want to talk anybody into anything. You know, that's how I got married. <laughs> so the key is, and this is what we used to always talk to our people about is, if you ask questions that start with, do you, can you, will you? then you're pretty much, you might as well just get back in your car and leave, right? And everything has to start with a what, how, when, where, and, you know, and then follow up with a why, right? Because you got to establish a little bit of pain. You know, when you know that you're getting the sale is when the client starts asking questions back with what, where, when, why, how, uh, because that essentially means that they're wanting you yeah. to add layers of context to to uh, the the explanation. Yeah. So when you when you tell that story right there, as a salesperson, you're you're watching that develop in your head. Right? Mm -hmm. Someone that might be listening that's not a salesperson needs to understand that this is not a sales gimmick. No. Okay, this is this is so you can actually get to what matters, because what happens when people ask the other questions, closed ended questions, you're just you're kind of just hovering. Yeah, you you know, you yes or a no, you or I don't know. What, yeah, yeah, get to it. And you only get to it by asking smart questions like why, how, when. And the key is we used to always talk about and I still talk about and I hope you do. I th I'm sure you do. The want behind the want behind the want. Right. At the end of the day. Nobody decides that they're going to buy a product or service for the sake of spending money or even just to solve a problem in the business. There's always an emotional element to it. There's always a purpose driven element to the decision. So the art form um, that we were trained on and learned and trained hundreds of people on is how to get to the want behind the want behind the want, the emotional driver. Because now you're no longer selling a product. You're impacting a life. You're changing the course of time for a person, an organization, a family. That's the difference maker. So to Sean's point, you know, asking those questions, that's not some scientific sales uh, training. Like if you ask it like this, you're going to get more sales. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is if you ask it like that, you're going to get to the heart of the matter. That's right. And it will give you far more purpose in what you're doing. And by the way, the, the direct uh, success correlation to that, you can match those two up. Because if you know what somebody wants behind the want, behind the want, now you can it. start actually focusing towards that on their behalf. And then you got to definitely have a happy client. That's and that the was the key. That's, 
that's really where you should try to get with anybody that you may potentially work with, right? Because the only the only, the most successful consulting engagements are the one where it is a partnership. Yeah. So why would you wait until down here, down the road to try to establish, establish it right up front? So that's what the client's going to expect. Even your sales guy has to be, you know, the has to portray, has to behave that way. And um, before you mentioned, you know, I'm on the front end and then there's the back end with them doing stuff. One of the things that makes this a little unique is we get to assist in the design. So by what we're collecting, and you've seen me do an initial sit with someone, mm -hmm. me two hours with someone I never met before. So you know what kind of what comes out of it. Yep. So it's the same type of frame that I'm running, you know, and, and family assets. What do you want in the future? That kind of stuff. And just kind of weave in, yep. you know, oh, I think we'd be able to do this. I think we can do benefit. that. That's a, that's a strong and just keep going and just work for them and then say, yeah, we've got a case here. You know, in some cases I could even say, I think we could save you at least this. Yeah. The beauty of it is the cadence, right? Because the, the, the fact is that you cannot just go in there and ask all questions with who, what, where, when, why, and think that that's going to be Excuse effective me, how either. Much money do you make? as much as you <laughs> can't do all presentation and think that that's going to be effective, right? It's got to be a combination where you're asking the questions and then you educate a little bit, you add a little bit of value benefit, you tell a story, um, you get acknowledgement, you ask, Hey, does that sound like something that would be a benefit to you? And yeah. then you go back to asking questions and you build this cadence to that where the client is fully engaged, but you can't, you got to, you got to teach them a little something. You got to give them a little knowledge, a little something Always. to hang on and some hope Always. in that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's important that the client leave the conversation knowing more than what he came. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's not a very high bar, but <laughs> it, it's definitely a bar that should be considered. Yes. So, yeah. And, you know, and you and I have always talked about, you know, if you concentrate on what's in front of you, uh, if you concentrate on the client, the client, the client, and think of it like really trying to solve a problem of some sort. And for sales guys, we have to say, is there a problem? Could there be a problem mm -hmm. is a better question. I don't know. Okay. Well, then you're starting to talk about where it could be, what you've seen in the past. What about this? What about that? Start poking around. Right. So and the client will like to talk about anything that they believe is going to potentially make something better for them. And I think that the more experiences you have in those types of conversations, I don't know how many sits I've had with clients, but it's got to be thousands. So sometimes somebody says, well, how did you do? I don't know. I just, yeah. I've been doing it for so long. So it's about being with someone, finding out, figuring out how, how to communicate with them to have a productive talk with them. Um, and then from there, just navigating the conversation to keeping in mind, you know, benefit, client, help, everything's pushed that him, 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 him. And all of the questioning, like you said, will bring out what the issue is and what we could potentially do. So that whole science or that dance that we're talking about, that, that, that two hour introduction, yes, you're interested, we're going to the next step kind of sale. Um, and it's repeatable and all the other steps, but that type of sale, uh, everybody should feel great at the end. Everybody. Yes. And what Sean I is mean, telling you guys uh, and gals that are listening to this is if you take the time and you ask the questions, you can increase the amount of clients that you uh, partner with, close, influence, persuade, whatever word feels better for you on the yes, first sit. On the yeah. first try, on the first sit. Those of you that have a long callback file <laughs> and do a lot of follow up, more than likely, say, yeah, what's a callback? More than likely, it's because <laughs> you aren't investing enough time in understanding the client. And I'll tell you another secret, and I don't know if Sean agrees with this, but we, we, he's got a different style than I do, but the two meshed really well together when we were leading teams. Um, I've always asked clients what their biggest strengths were um, before I ever talked about problems, weaknesses, or goals. 
I always wanted to get out what their biggest strength was because I found if I could get them ha- giving me dialogue about something that they were really proud about, um, mm-hmm. the likelihood most humans are really good. And when you give them a chance to brag about themselves, they mm-hmm. will then recognize, oh, no, I'm saying a lot of good stuff about myself. You know what they'll do? They'll become more vulnerable and willing to open up and tell you what they feel is lacking. It's really strange. It's almost like, wait a minute, this dude just gave me this platform to brag a little bit. I got to, like, I'm putting myself up here. Now I got to feel like I got to bring myself down here a little bit more human in that right. effort to kind of humanize themselves and not, and stop this deific- deifying themselves. Deification, <laughs> is that a word? Stop them from being up here. Yeah. What they end up mm-hmm. doing is going, you know what I really could use, Sean? I really could use this. Well, guess what? They just opened the door up. So that's right. a little trick to try. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, if you could, uh, if you could pull that off, you're, you're going to get them going. Right? So, style is different, you know. Um, you would also ask someone, and, and uh, for people listening, don't kid yourself. He's John's not a lollipop. So, he, I've heard you where somebody on the phone where you've actually just right off the bat uh, said, "Okay, what's your greatest challenge?" Just out of no. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah. Good. We're working with my guy here. He wanted me, us to talk about potentially coming in and doing something. So let me ask you, what's what what's your greatest challenge right now? And then you would shut up and the guy would just tell you everything that's going on. He goes, great. We'll have somebody there at nine o'clock. <laughs> and, Sometimes and, and just going it. for it. <laughs> well, I think I think a lot of it is really being able to recognize you have great instincts. You, do, you really do. I appreciate it. Um, and being able to recognize, again, what do you have in front of you? Who do you have in front of you? What's the situation? Be aware of your surroundings, right? Yeah. Get on the swivel. Be ready. Because that's going to determine. It's not I start here and then I go. There's a lot of things that in a sale, in order to end up in a position where you have somebody asking you for help and you're hugging each other. Mm-hmm. Okay? The ultimate. Right. You know. It, there's there's a lot of right that has to happen. Mm-hmm. It's There's a lot. And there's also a lot that can go wrong. And I think that salespeople, and you know this, they're either, they're either getting caught off in the front, they get yep. stuck in the middle because they don't have a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> and then, and, 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 or, they, or, they, or they can't ever bring it home. A sales so, presentation is much like a good book or a good story. There should be a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> How many times have I heard you tell somebody? It's hysterical. Um, uh, have a pitch. Just have a pitch. It doesn't have even have pitch. to be good. Like, have a pitch. Like have if somebody something. walks up to you, you're pumping gas and goes, oh, I like the logo on your shirt. What do you do? You should have a really good story to tell. I don't know. Right. And by the way, if you get asked like 50 times in a row, that story maybe should be somewhat similar, That you, but you build on it and build on it and build on it. But right, yeah, right, right. it's kind of Crazy. important. <laughs> it is. It is. And, you know, when we were when we were working together, um, you know, that culture that we were building there and what we were trying to instill in people, the best that we could. It's a very difficult job because you couldn't you really couldn't allocate the amount of time yeah. to every person that really, you know, could have benefited. Distracted from it. It in was, activity. Those of you that don't know, you're kind of maybe reading the signs. Sean and I work together quite well, but we worked in an environment. If you've seen the movie Boiler Room. OK, we were boiler room before boiler room was boiler room. Right. I think that, you know, I f- sometimes I felt like Ben Affleck in that in that movie. And it was um, very now, meanwhile, from from the standpoint of who we are as human beings, we were both having out of body experience because it was not um, we liked the fast paced environment. We loved getting in the grind with salespeople and training and teaching. We love getting in the grind and really helping clients to advance and move forward. What we didn't like was. You know, um, some like the the un, unrelenting get the number, get the number, get the number, get the number. Like you unrelenting, like there was nothing else important. And um, we all came out that other side. Now, granted, we learned a ton, gained a ton of knowledge. I would oh not gosh. be who I am right now had I not gone through that experience. I wouldn't have the relationships and so on. So we all go through parts of life in our career and our life that were really, really um much more good than bad much more good than bad Re- but so really really impactful good. but boy we wish that it could have been done a different way sean and i tried and tried and tried 
to have an impact on culture and oh. and style. And it just was not going to be heard. So inevitably, you move on to the next thing. But I want to tell you that so much of the good I use in my life now, um, and I know that you do as well, but now we get to do it with a different purpose and a different culture, with a different mindset, and more of a client-first focus than a get-the-number focus, right? Which is which is um, yeah, you know it's it's tremendous. crazy because because it, in that environment the 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 sale itself was a very had to be a very polished sale, mm-hmm. okay, for it to be a good sale. I'm yeah, not yeah. talking about here sign this. I'm not talking. I'm talking about a, a sale that actually gets a project yep. that runs and goes right. So I mean that 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 was important. So you, that that to me was always the saving grace in that no matter whatever the other noise was that was going on, the bottom line is, is that in my mind, the most successful people in that very competitive environment. I mean, if you were, if you were a top 20 salesperson in that company, you'd be a number one in a lot of other. Oh yeah. You really would. Oh yeah. Um, And so that, that, the polish aspect of it and what it required for me was always the attraction. Like you still have to be skillful enough to do this. This is not, this is a difficult thing. And if you do it well, you can help a lot of people. You can make a living. You could really write your own ticket. You can. It was like a polished marathon runner, Mm -hmm. right? Like that had to have all the attributes of the most polished Olympian marathon runner. You just had to do it in a 40 yard dash. (laughs) Like it was like, go. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, although we were tied uh, to the same responsibilities and authorities and and comp, right. You were in uh, an office building where you not only had to deal with me (laughs) yeah but all of the external you know 12 hours a day the noise um people just walking in and out i mean that place used to hum i've been (laughs) so um crazy and here i am in in a car somewhere in kentucky or wherever i i am and i've got somebody sitting next to me that i've never met before yeah uh and and you got to spend 10 hours with them and and, and they're on week three and you have they, they they've got uh two different color socks on and a polyester suit <laughs> you're like did recruiting yeah. look at a picture of this human being before they brought him in like what are we going what's going actually, on here actually what was what was better in that situation was when we went to the other place that provided similar services yeah. at least the sales staff there, although um, nimbler, <laughs> much more nimble. Yes. Um, but we would ride together, so it was like having two veterans together. Yeah. Go out. That, that was great. That was cool. That, was that team selling. Yeah, you, you and I went. You and I went out. Yeah. And and went and met business owners one day. We had a ball. We had a blast. Good guys. I think we had. Yeah, it was awesome. I think we had six appointments and had three sales. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in closing, tell us what's great at TSP family office. What's on the horizon? What's the big plan? So, Are you guys taking over the world? What's going on? So here's the deal. In about, I don't know, uh, a little more than a month, people are going to start to get their uh, drafts of their yeah. 21 tax returns. And somehow, some way, people typically have questions about that before they file. Shocking. Right. So we are anticipating that uh, we'll see an influx of clients just by that event. We've been able to track that over the years to know that around that time of year, people see it. And they're like, OK, enough is enough. So we'll run more ads. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll try we'll try to uh, um, leverage that so that we can reach more people, increase odds. Uh, get more feed and then convert and 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 bring in some really nice new clients, especially for some of the guys that um, are newer and utilizing our marketing effort. Look, it's very satisfying when you're making marketing efforts and you actually get sales off of that. So, Sean, your uh, our audience is national, right? So um, is yeah. your is your presence, your reach 
a national national reach? I know you're down in Florida, uh, but right. are you, do you have a national reach yeah. with your services? We we do, John. That's Perfect. a great question. And I didn't lob that to you. I swear. Perfect. Um, yeah. So we have clients all over the United States, uh, Hawaii, Alaska, um, only U.S. tax law applies if you are have Canadian. We don't do Canadian taxes, mm -hmm. uh, any of that. But we do have clients that are Canadian who are here, uh, you know, uh, visa or working here or whatever. If they're paying U.S. taxes, you're a potential client. If you own a business and you're you're bringing in half a million, six hundred thousand for your personal income, you should try to get in touch with us because. It's at that point in a business that size that if you started doing forming the good habits from a tax perspective yep. and gaining that liquid and putting it to work for you, then you're going to shorten the rope on when it's up to you when you quit. So okay? when Sean it's means by that as well is that far too many businesses wait until they have to file their taxes to believe that they're going to have an impact on that. And your tax strategy is fluid and starts January 1 and goes through. So it's what you do leading up to 1231 or if you're a fiscal, uh, right. you know, it, it, different, you know, like a C corporation might have a 331 year end, whatever it might be. But it's what you do leading up to that that defines what your taxes will be, what the outcome is. So taxes, just like life, is a journey. You want a great outcome. It's not just having an expectation for the outcome. You have to set the steps along the way, and it's the journey there. It's every little maneuver, how you buy, how you sell, mm -hmm. how you hire, how you fire, uh, the insurance you have. I mean, it's every decision that you make along the way that dictates and determines what your tax outcome will be. And right. we are going to put Sean's contact information in the description of the podcast um, and you'll have links and information to get in a hold of Sean directly or to yeah. look up TSP family office and kind of do your own little investigation. And then sure. by the way, if you're a business owner doing over half a million dollars a year, I'm telling you right now, you want a guy that's going to punch you in the gut and then give you a big hug and then help you to laugh down the street with how much <laughs> money you saved. You need to call Sean. That's the guy to call. There it is. Thanks. Thanks, Mo. Appreciate it. I appreciate you, Sean. Hey, Sean, you've been in the club. Thanks for going clubbing with us. Listen, Club Colors is on the move. We are having a blast here. If you're not checking us out on our website, www.clubcolors.com, what else do we need to do, my friends? Please give us a follow. Check us out. Hello.